pressure looks good. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good morning. Wherever you are watching around the world, thank you so much for joining us for this week's episode of NASA Space Five Live. I'm here to discuss another week in space news. My name is Thomas Burkhart. I am an editor and reporter for NASA Space Flight, and I'm joined by two of our fellow NSF reporters on this side. We've got Mr. Chris Gebhardt, Assistant Managing Editor of NASA Space Flight. Chris, how are you doing today? I'm doing just fine. How about yourself, Thomas? I'm doing well. And on the other side of me, we've got Mr. Philip Sloss, NASA Center's editor for NASA Space Flight. Philip, how are you doing? Good. How are you guys doing today? We're doing good. We've got a bunch of space news to talk about, as always. Some SpaceX stuff, some SLS stuff, some Russian Soyuz launches. We're going to talk about all of it this week. And, uh, of course, during the show, we're also going to answer lots of questions. So if you have questions about whatever we may be talking about at that time, feel free to throw them in the chat. And if you tag us with at NASA Space Flight, that'll help us see them. And we'll try to answer a bunch of those questions along the way as well. Wanted this to be a live and interactive show, as always. Uh, but to start off, let's, I think we're going to start off with a quick launch recap. We've got actually four or orbital launches that happened this week. So let's dive into that really quick. Uh, first off, from the Baikonur Cos Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, we had a Soyuz rideshare mission carrying a South Korean satellite as well as several, uh, a couple dozen uh, secondary payloads, small, small sats and CubeSats and things like that, successfully launched from Baikonur by the Roscosmos commercial arm. Uh, How do I pronounce this? Uh, they, see, they have the abbreviation in the channel name, so I don't remember what they're called. Glass, Glass Cosmos or something like that? Chris, Cosmos, you know. Yeah, I, th I think that sounds about right, yes. Yeah, that one. Uh, basically, a commercial Soyuz launch uh, went perfectly as well. And so, well, all right, Soyuz doing its best Starship SN11 impression from yesterday, descending, in, <laughs> climbing into some fog, but a successful launch there. Uh, but we once also, again, proving that Soyuz waits for no weather. <laughs> right, Soyuz laughs at weather constraints, and then we get this animation. All right, we'll, we'll cut away to the next one. Uh, also on that sort of side of the world, we got uh, down in New Zealand, we had the Rocket Lab mission, the electron launch of They Go Up So Fast, carrying a couple satellites for some various customers, some commercial customers. For I think Black Sky was on there. There was a couple um, Royal Australian Air Force payloads on board. Um, and interestingly, there was a very cool payload in the form of a photon satellite pathfinder uh, as Rocket Lab gets ready to support NASA's Capstone mission, which of course we're going to be talking about a lot about the Artemis program today, but uh, Capstone is this uh, CubeSat mission NASA's got planned to go to the moon uh, later this year, launching on Electron using the photon satellite bus. And uh, so uh, Rocket Lab getting some flight experience ahead of that launch. Uh, this mission went very, very well as well. And uh, another success as Rocket Lab's second launch of the year. Uh, and then, speaking of other American companies, we had a SpaceX Starlink launch. Of course, these are just getting routine at this. Well, I don't know, it's dangerous to call them routine, but regular and frequent, I guess, is what we should say. Um, <laughs> the Starlink L22 mission launched from Pad 40 at Cape Canaveral, successfully delivering 60 more satellites to low Earth orbit. Um, they're actually getting close. Chris, remind me, how do we know how many more launches there are for, to complete the initial phase? Because they're getting close. Yeah, so they're in the 1300s um, now, um, and the initial orbital shell will take uh, 1500. But remember, a good portion of those are the test batch that are no longer up there. So they can do 60 at a time. So 60, 120, and then I mean, it's still a fair amount. They're, they'll, they're probably more or less on track to be complete with that initial shell by the summertime months to the northern hemisphere. Um, which more or less keeps them on, barely on track to where they had said they wanted to be when the Constellation really began launching in its operational form in November of 2019. All right, so they're getting close to finishing that first orbital shell for the Starlink Constellation. Of course, there's other shells beyond that. Starlink launches aren't going anywhere. But, no, they're uh, not. <laughs> but uh, we had another successful one this week. Of course, the stage also landed successfully and came back to port yesterday. Uh, so six, successful Falcon 9 recovery as well. And we're going to talk a little bit about Falcon 9 recovery in a bit because there's some new boosters coming. But go ahead, Chris. Ah, I was going to say, yes, some new members are on their way. Uh, no, I just thought it was worth pointing out, too, that that while they might have the, the total number that they need up there to complete the initial orbital shell by the summer months, 
uh, that that's not when the actual orbital shell will be completed because the that's satellites true. still need to be activated and drifted over into other planes and brought up into the correct al altitudes. So that's why you might say, well, Chris, what do you mean the first shell will be completed by um, summer? No, they'll just all more or less be in orbit by that point. Right. But that's why, you know, even for me, like, Starlink availability where I live is well after that because of how they have to re all the satellite. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so that was the third lunch, and then we had a fourth lunch this week back over with our friends in Russia and Roscosmos. This lunch actually coming from Russia, the Vostokny Cosmodrome, uh, and launching a different satellite internet constellation, the OneWeb constellation, uh, on its fifth flight. Um, of course, the OneWeb constellation is different from the Starlink constellation. It has a lot less satellites because they orbit a little bit higher, um, so they don't need as many to provide the same sort of global coverage. But uh, they are making more progress on deploying their constellation, and they are launching on Soyuz rockets, which are jointly operated by Ariane Space and StarSim, which and StarSim is jointly operated by Ariane Space and Roscosmos. <laughs> it's a whole confusing thing. Basically, Europe and Russia collaborating and get, and get to provide those launch services. Um, and that was another successful launch to happen this week. Four, la four launch attempts this week. Well, all right, we can. Starship SN11 had a launch well, attempt, I guess, technically, but um, four orbital launch attempts, and I think they all went successfully, unless I'm missing one. Uh, well, no, but but it's worth mentioning that the first Soyuz, the one that launched the uh, CAS 500 and, and rideshare yeah. payloads, had a rare scrub. Oh, that's true. On the first day that it tried it to It did go. eventually launch, yes. but it had a delay. Yeah. Which is very rare, but of course, and then it launched into bad weather anyway. So yes. who knows what Soyuz <laughs> is up to? But uh, yeah, so that's just a quick recap of the launches coming up. Let's dive into some news regarding a couple of SpaceX things to talk about. I'm going to bring this one up first. We are good old friend Crew Dragon Resilience, right? Uh, so let's talk about. The International Space Station. So yesterday, and I'm also going to bring up this blog post by NASA because it has the words that I need to say out loud. Um, basically, there, there was there was a very weird scenario on the International Space Station. I, I think you two are familiar with what happened. Basically, there was a some sort of like radiation anomaly or out of norm radiation event which tripped up uh, some circuitry on the International Space Station. Some a computer that communicates between Crew Dragon and the ISS had some, some circuitry issue due to some radiation problem, and a bunch of alarms got sounded on the vehicle. Yeah. What, what does that look like when you hear, I mean, there was depressurization alarms, a fire alarm, and I think a couple others. What do you, how do you react when five different alarms go off at once on your spacecraft? Yeah, so, yeah, so, so this is a very good point. So um, uh, this, this is part of what the crew is, is trained for, um, to... To how, how to react to particular alarms and who's going to be doing what based on what kind of an emergency the station is trying to tell you it is experiencing. Um, in this case, it was very thankfully just a false alarm because, yeah, it was a fire indication inside of Dragon and a rapid depressurization um, al alarms that were going off that all just ended up being the station's just computers just kind of had a hiccup and a panic attack um, and sounded alarms when there were actually no problems, but what the crew is trained to deal with. So, um, you know, um, uh, it was uh, Shannon Walker on the U.S. segment side, and I believe it was Serge, uh, Sergei Rizhikov on the Russian side, both contacted their respective mission controls to alert them as to what was going on as the other crew members tried to figure out where the depress was coming from and start those procedures. But of course, mission control and the crew is also looking at the pressure indicators within the space station, which are telling them everything is fine, but the alarms are going off, right? So it's all about the training that kicks in in that moment instead of panic, because it, it would be easy to panic in, in a situation like that for when you aren't trained to in, in that type of scenario and what do you do in emergency situations, right? It's, it's the same, it's that same basic kind of training that first responders have, right? So you don't become overwhelmed at a situation that you need to triage, that you need to take care of. Um, so, and, and that's exactly what we saw was that really expert deep level training kick in to very quickly realize that there wasn't an actual issue on board. Absolutely. And of course, this is, we're talking about a, a, the commercial crew vehicle, dot to an admittedly aging International Space Station, but, which well, I don't know if age is any part of this, but 
worth pointing out that all of this experience is going to tie into the next phase of NASA exploration. We're talking about like Artemis. We're going to have the next generation Orion crew vehicle docking to things like Lunar Gateway or docking to moon landers. I mean, Philip, can you speak to, has NASA taken a lot of those kind of lessons learned or is there anything that even like uh, they've incorporated into things like Orion or the, uh, those other our Artemis vehicles that maybe reduce the likelihood of like false alarms and or just make better alarm systems or things like that? I mean, I don't know that you, you know, if you have cosmic radiation, you know, you can get a bit flip, you know, you something, you know, a, a cosmic ray or some sort of energy can turn a zero into a one when it's not supposed to do that. Um, and so, you know, I think the stuff that Chris is talking about, I mean, it, it, I was just thinking about um, recently uh, Glenn Lunny, who's a you know legend from the mission operations director and i was he just recently passed away and i was going through some of his old uh, oral histories he did with the johnson space center and he's talking about the cardinal rule in a situation is i mean it's the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy in, in, in essence it's a don't panic he didn't say anything about a towel but the idea is you don't want to you don't want to go crazy and make the situation worse so it's if if you're in a if you're in an emergency situation or it's, you have an indication that you're in an emergency situation, you you want to you know you the you, the training is I think the idea behind the training is not to make the situation worse. You just you know you, you're supposed to go through it in an orderly fashion, and you know as as Chris was also saying, you you triage such the situation, and so I think. Um, you know, I don't know what the timeline was for the response to this, but um, I think, you know, it, there may be some things that they have to review from the uh, station operations standpoint. But I would imagine that they probably they probably calmed down relatively quickly. Other than it's probably, I mean, it it maybe got to the point where it's just like, you know, how do we get the alarms to go off? How do we get the master, you know, the, the caution and warning, the master alarms? just get that noise to go down because like they probably figured out relatively quickly. Okay. We, I don't, you know, we're not seeing any leak rates. We're not seeing any, any of those kinds of things. And so, you know, I think for Artemis, you know, these are the types of things that we're going to, that, that hopefully they're going to start to see on the, on the first mission, which is, um, you know, getting beyond the, you know, getting reasonably far beyond the earth's magnetic field. Um, you'll get it. You'll have a different environment that they'll be flying through. Um, so, you know, they, they may learn something on this, but they've tried to design it to, you know, to, to, uh, uh beyond, uh, low earth orbit, but this will be the first time that this, that this spacecraft has flown, you know, beyond a couple thousand miles, um, above, above the surface. I, I, I think the other thing that, that to me that, that brings up are, are, are two key points that this does happen periodically between visiting vehicles on the International mm -hmm. Space Station as they're working out, right, what what are the quirks and the little peculiarities that each vehicle has that's intended to them? You know, I, and, and, and there were times when we were learning this as we were expanding the space station where we realized, oh, you know, alarms kept going off because of ventilation and, and CO buildups in, in visiting vehicles. And eventually we realized we just need to run air hoses so we can equalize the flow of air between all the modules, right? These are all those little things that you learn so in, in the grand scheme of things, this is a minor little learning curve as to, you know, how you might need to, what the sensors read and how they're responding to events. Um, but the other thing too, is like this also demonstrates how fortunate we are in terms of not having a communications lag with the International Space Station, because the farther out you start to go, the more training crews are going to to be able to diagnose that without any help from mission control on the ground because you can still have some support for mission control in cis lunar space but you start going out to mars right. you can't wait 11 minutes for mission control to tell you no your spacecraft isn't on fire exactly you know uh, and it's worth noting, so the, the exact wording in this blog post says that the NASA and SpaceX team determined the likely cause was a radiation interference on a Dragon to Station communication device. So this radiation risk, which in low Earth orbit isn't that bad, you're still within a large part of Earth's magnetic field, so you get some protection from there. I'll bet it's not as good as on the surface of Earth. Um, but as soon as you go out to cis lunar space, or especially you go out to Mars, 
that radiation risk only increases. So your risk of you, you have to make sure you shield your electronics properly and shield the habitats properly, et cetera. So of course they'll they'll learn from that too. Um, but yeah, I think it's just interesting to say. And I, I like Phil. I, I don't remember. It might have been a Chris Hadfield quote that says, "There's no problem in space that you can't make worse." So yep. you want to, <laughs> yes. I, I got the, yes. So, so that's a very important part of astronaut training. And of course, they handled it well, as we would expect from our station crews. Uh, really quick, let me see if we've got any questions. I know we've got a bunch of super chats here. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Thomas with Thomas Anfang, a regular in the chat, says, Heisenberg just told me my exact velocity, and now I'm lost. What should I do? Nice <laughs> physics joke there. Appreciate the uh, support. Uh, Paul Sherrard with a super chat as well. Thank you so much for your support. Uh, Fire Guy says, thanks you guys so much for all you do. As a fellow nerd, I honestly can't express how appreciative I am of everything you all do and teach us. Well, thank you so much, Fire Guy, for the kind words and for the support. We're glad you enjoy. Uh, Corporal Daywalker, who has been a regular in the stream recently as well, with a generous $50 super chat that says happy birthday. I, oh, it's NSF's birthday. Uh, for a second, I had to forget oh. what she was talking about. Oh, geez, I completely forgot. Yeah, so today is the 16th birthday of NASASpaceflight.com, and I can't believe I forgot to mention that on the episode today. I literally said I was going to talk about it yesterday, and then I didn't. You know, in terms so, yeah. of the hierarchy of the organization, I don't think you're the one who'd be in hot water there. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for the reminder, Dave Walker, as well as the very generous super chat. And Are you sure that wasn't Chris? <laughs> yeah, maybe Chris has a, has a burner account and he's super chatting us to remind us. Right. Oh, <laughs> uh, geez. Thank you so much. And happy birthday to the entire NSF team, not just of those of us on air today. Um, let's see here. Let's dive into. Oh, yeah. We got uh, some more SpaceX news to talk about. I'm going to bring up some very cool photos and. At the request of Mr. Uh, hold on, I got a, uh, now the link's not working. Hold on one second. We've got we've got some new uh, SpaceX news, not in the form of dragons, but in the form of Falcon boosters. Uh, yes. we, we've, we have two at you to talk about. Chris, you want to talk about this for a second while I can get some images up? Yeah, so um, two uh, Falcon uh, cores came through, including the Falcon Heavy Center core in B N sixty six, which had um, its uh, firing. Um, and also there was Falcon 9 booster uh, B1067 following closely behind that has been installed vertically um, onto the stand there. So um, McGregor continuing to, uh, continuing to uh, move those boosters through. Oh my gosh, the dial-up speed on this is bringing well, me okay, back. Okay, so the, here's the, the problem <laughs> is that these images are super high resolution. I and so I, was say. I should have just let it load and then moved it over, yeah, but I, I didn't. So. Well, we're we're getting a dramatic him. reveal is what I'm going to call this. Okay? this th there's some serious 90s nostalgia here. <laughs> like, it just needs to, like, freeze right now, and it would nail it. Like, right, yeah, that's true. That's a fair point. There you go. But there we go. Yes, yeah, so this was the uh, static firing oh, of Falcon wow. uh, of Falcon Heavy Core uh, B-1066, um, as seen at the McGregor test facility. So, yeah, um, you know, McGregor is uh, usually is known now for the Raptor testing um, and the mm -hmm. rapid um, the rapid acceptance testing for the Raptor engines before they are shipped to Boca to be installed on Starships. But they do, um, it is still serving as the, um, uh, for that same qualification purpose for the Falcon 9s, not just the second stages, but the new first stages um, and cores as they come through. So yeah, um, the heavy core done, and if it was good, should be on its way. And uh, the next one is vertical. Ready, right, ready so, to hold on, really quick. Well. I just want to point out our good friend yeah. Grasshopper, who's still standing tall at McGregor and uh, <laughs> watching over everything. If you've met, if you've heard us mention on Starship streams, we compare a lot of like the early Starship vehicles to Grasshopper, right? Um, obviously, they're doing a little bit higher than Grasshopper ever did at this point. But so when we talk about like Starhopper, was the Starship version of Grasshopper, and that's the little yep. little uh, prototype that they used to start landing Falcon nines. Um, but yeah, you can see barely, you can see kind of the top of the Falcon Heavy center core, uh, Booster 1066, for the USS F-44 mission launching later this year. Um, this photo and the next one I'm also going to show are both from our, our good friend Gary Blair, who is a NASA Space Flight uh, Forum member. And uh, these photos are all visible on L2. So if you are not familiar, you can check out nasaspaceflight.com slash L2 to get some very, uh, very cool explosive photos and, and documentation and things like that on a whole bunch of space programs, not just SpaceX. But uh, there's a lot of good info in there. And I was I told the boss on our birthday that I would plug L2. So there you go. Check out L2. But this is the other core that we want to talk about. <laughs> 
Falcon. I love how you just said, I promised the boss on our birthday as if you didn't just immediately forget. Like, well, I did forget, but now I'm remembering. It. <laughs> I love it. No, I love it. Uh, this is Falcon 9 Booster 1067, the next booster off the assembly line over in California, trucked over to McGregor and is now vertical, ready for its acceptance testing. Uh, and look I was... at that lightning protection tower that we've got there. Yep. <laughs> So this is super interesting yeah. because we obviously SpaceX is relying a lot on reuse to meet their launch cadence right now. They're reflying boosters a lot, um, but I, I occasionally we'll have a booster take a drink. You have you had two boosters that have failed to land in relatively recently, um, and then also some of these boosters are getting old. I mean, one booster just had its ninth flight. We know they're they're expecting to get around ten at least, um, possibly more. Depends on what the data looks like afterwards. Um, but eventually, those boosters may be retired because they're getting old. In which case, you're gonna need to replenish those too. So SpaceX, I think, is looking to kind of grow their Falcon 9 fleet, right? Oh, very very much so. I mean, and and, and the more new Falcon heavy boosters that that you can bring into the fleet, the better that that's gonna end up. Um, the better that's gonna end up being for the overall manifest and the flexibility that it gives them, especially since, you know, what what we know from what SpaceX has said publicly is that the plan is once these boosters reach flight number 10, that's when some more extensive inspections mm -hmm. are going to be needed, which means they're going to be out of the rotation for longer than, than some of these record turnarounds that we've been seeing recently. And that's going to hurt too, especially, like you said, like the booster that they lost, um, was it last month? Um, that they lost one during the landing burn. Um, yeah. Again, yeah. So, um, yeah, the, and, and and the fact that you know one is approaching that limit right now, and a couple are up there with it, is gonna start hurting if you can't get new boosters in. Right. I've got a very interesting question here that ties into all this McGregor work. So uh, a question here asking, how does the failure of Raptor engines compare to Merlin engines during development? And I'm going to expand that to another engine that I know had some development problems, the Space Shuttle main engine slash RS-25, whatever we're calling them these days. But uh, is, we, we talked about, we've seen during Starship testing, Raptor issues have been sort of a common factor in some of the failures that they've had. Is this on is this more or less frequent than what we'd expect from a normal engine development program maybe comparing not just to merlin another spacex program but to non-spacex programs what, what what are we expecting as far as developmental engine reliability it, it, it's a good question in, in general it's very on par with how um engine development usually goes um you know and and you know, to be fair, right, some of the failures that we've seen, right, weren't the engine's fault, but were systemic from, from issues within the Starship design, right, and how that's been tweaked, right? Like, it wasn't, like, yes, you can say, like, when the SN8 failure occurred, oh, it was because the Raptor engine failed. Well, the Raptor engine failed because the tank depressurized. Right. That's not the Raptor's fault even though it's just easier to say, oh, it failed because of the Raptor. And the same thing with the helium ingestion on the last one and, and everything, right? So from what we are seeing, it, I, it, it's not concerning. Um, and another thing to bear in mind, most companies don't do mo a lot of the testing of their engines in flight <laughs> with right, actual sure. flight hardware. Um, a lot of it is to, it, you know, takes place in, in, in the desert where you can't see it, right? Or behind the closed gates of Stennis right um when it's not necessarily a nasa test firing right the public's not in the public and the media aren't invited to every test firing that happens at stennis right. either so you know it, it, it's just more it's more visible is what i would say um in in in, in that regard um but i know the ssmes did have um had their own share of failures during their test campaigns yeah. on, on the stands at stennis uh philip you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, gee, if only if we had some RS-25 testing to talk about anyway today. This is a perfect segue. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I, you know, we we had the uh, had the finally had the full duration uh, green run hot fire uh, the the second time around um, on the on the 18th, and so um, they released they released some of the test cam uh, test stand cameras. Um, yesterday, and so we got to see sort of the full these three engine gimbling tests that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. And so, you know, during the test, the engines they 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 start up to 100 percent, and then they throttle up to 109, and then you have um, about 60 seconds in. They they did this first 
uh, wiggle test. This, this actually is a lot more pronounced than the one in the middle that we're going to show you sped up. Um, but you can see here the engines throttled down from 109. You can just start to see the uh, the, the the shock cones, the bottom of the, or the top of the shock diamonds uh, there, and then they throttled back up about 20 seconds later to 109 percent. Um, so the engines did this uh, circular pattern um, for about 30 seconds, and uh, you'll see them snap, stop, um, and then um, the next test. Uh, occurred about two and a half minutes into the into the burn, and you'll see the video speed up here. And the 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 movement of the nozzles is a lot more subtle, even at high speed here. But, but I sped it up just to make it a little bit more uh, uh, oh. obvious. And so you can see there are more abrupt, uh, different frequencies, different um, you know time scales. And the idea was more for um, it was a secondary test objective, and the idea was to give them more structural frequency response when you when you wiggle the engines like that. Um, and then again, at the very end of the burn here, you can see it's a little harder to see, but the engines are throttled down to 85% here already. And they'd done a stair step throttle down in little increments where they throttle down from 109 to 100 to 95 to 90 and so forth. And then when they got down to 85%, they did this, they did this same circular movement um, for about 25 seconds, and then this this ended just before uh, just before shutdown, and the shutdown itself was also a test objective, which basically they let the systems. It's a hydrogen oxygen. You want to you definitely want to stay biased, and you want to have fuel. You don't want to uh, otherwise you start burning engine hardware instead of instead of fuel. So the system's biased to the oxygen side, so that if you run out of propellant. The oxygen side is going to run out first, and and so instead of shutting down like they would do with a guidance system cut off, they would usually shut down before 500 seconds of burn time. Um, they they basically just let the they just let the vehicle drain the the oxygen tank, and um, and then that was it. And so, um, you know, that's. Uh, is this the second video? <laughs> I, I, I think I just had it to loop because I had a question about okay, this. We sure. were talking yeah. about we, we had like the two different sort of magnitudes of gimbal tests. Which one right. of those is more similar to what you would the, the rocket would actually have to do to steer itself on flight? Is it closer to the second one? Is it pretty like minute yeah, changes? I mean like this this to me is like so you do have some engine throttling, so this so but to me the analogy is this is the type of thing you never want to do in flight, these type right. this type of um, this would be like driving your car, jamming your foot down the accelerator, and then turning the steering wheel as hard as you could without slowing down. So this is the kind of thing you never want to do in flight. So the engines in the in these in this, these circular gimbal tests, they're moving at 10 degrees a second. The, the circle, the, the the radius of the circle is only one degree. But I mean, they they can actually the the range of gimbal motion is actually out to I believe eight or ten degrees, so they could swing quite a bit if they need to. Um, but you know, generally that means if if you're having an issue like that, you're you have other problems. And so, for right. instance, and, they can't fight the boosters, for instance, because the boosters have a lot more thrust. Right, so, and 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 isn't that large gimbal range to account for some of the scenarios like when you get higher into your ascent and you've got more energy and you get into like engine out capability mode where you need to adjust how your engines are firing to adjust for losing one? Like isn't isn't that yes. really what that large range of motion yes. is for? And then you also have you 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 still can I suppose have a theoretical thrust imbalance. There's only so much you can take between the boosters, so you know, they they should basically be seeing the same environments, both of them. Um, but there's a tolerable amount of thrust imbalance you can get between the boosters, and so, you know, they the the booster nozzles themselves are also steerable, so they would use those, and they obviously have you have more control authority, obviously, because those are you know three million pounds a, a piece, and between these between the four engines, you only have about a million and a half to two millions of pounds of thrust. Um, for those so um yeah gotcha i'll bring up the second video i know so let's talk about sort of the outcome of this test. this test went full duration unlike the first attempt so they resolved those issues um was this a completely successful test and if so where does that put us on as far as shipping this stage to kennedy space center 
it, they sh they were talking about 30 days of refurbishment. Um, this is this this is just showing what happened to the 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 base heat shield, which is the 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 face of the bow tail that's you know that sees the most heat from the engines burning, and they put extra uh, thermal protection system on there. But you can still see it it gets so hot over eight minutes, about five minutes into the burn, so not even eight minutes. So about five minutes into the burn is what we're looking at right here. There, there's a layer of, of, of foil tape over the cork uh, insulation. And the, so the foil and then the, the, the tape itself, and then the actual adhesive tape, the, 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 the adhesive that, that holds the tape to the cork, at some point, once the foil burns away, then just the, the, the chemical adhesive starts to burn. And so um, that, uh, by the time that the the firing finished, and you can see here, we're looking at that that last gimbal profile, and it just stopped. You see the engines are throttled at eighty five percent here, and um, but you can see around the the uh, above that area, you have the same foil over the cork. It did a lot better, and then obviously uh, the the engine blankets still look relatively good. Um, what they decided to do there was they had. Uh, this plastic water uh, moisture barrier, or you know, called rain cover, is a better way of putting it. But they just basically decided to take that plastic stuff off. I don't know if they did it right before the test, but because um, it was just going to burn anyway, and so they just took that ignition source off. And so the blankets, the thermal blankets themselves, which are kind of pink looking, um, we noticed in the broadcast before ignition. Um, those, those, you know, the the thermal insulating properties, uh, they did fine, and they did say um, they've got they had a bunch of temperature sensors in the inside the boat tail on the inside, that, and they never got above 100 degrees Fahrenheit, so which is you know which is fine. Because I was going to say, and I, and I think it's worth stressing, as as dramatic as this looks, right? It, it's it's not something that would actually occur in flight because the vehicle right. would be in vacuum at this point right and it was and it was expected even as dramatic as it looked you you could hear them on the communications net talking about it and talking about sensor readings and like just making sure but they they did expect this to happen even with the hydrogen burn-off system right and that's and and that's the reason for the foil is because uh they don't need the foil for flight um i guess they've gone back and forth about whether they might they might leave it on or not but we may uh, we may just see uh, it may the, the 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 bottom of the stage may just look white, um, which is just they have cork absorbs a lot of water. You don't want to carry any extra weight, so they they put a they put a, a a coat of white paint over it to as a moisture barrier, and um, so this foil was there because of this test. Um, the 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 heat flux, the amount of heat that the that the that base heat shield sees in this test because you're at sea level for eight minutes um, with the engines um, going for that whole time it was is worse than uh launch and ascent and so um this is a this was a uh, for the base heat shield was a worse environment than for flight um even though you will have perhaps so you you know in flight you're going to have these two solid rocket boosters that are burning practically in line with the engine so they will see some thermal spikes, uh, especially early in the flight. And then as the vehicle climbs, obviously the plume's going to expand. Um, so they will s definitely see uh, a, a heat flux during the flight. But, you know, like Chris was saying, um, as as you, you get up out of the uh, discernible atmosphere relatively quickly. And so uh, after that, they should, they should see localized heating in some places, but uh, they, it, it shouldn't be as severe as what they just saw. And so um, all of that is to say in that 30 days of refurbishment, they'll, they'll be looking to do some cleanup um, and, and repairs of the, of the uh, base heat shield there and then any foam repairs that they might have to do. Um, but probably the m most work will just be doing the standard engine turnaround uh, that they just did after the first, you know, which is um, whether the engine's fired for one minute or eight minutes, they basically right. have to do the same types of inspections and 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 you know just if there are any repairs, they'll they'll do those too. So, um, so about thirty days refurbishment before shipping, and then once it's there, I believe we've got we've got actually a recent story about this. But to summarize the article, what what are we talking about for a launch date? This, I mean, are we 
Is this year on the table? I guess is my question. Well, this is. I, yeah, I, I'm a Rocket fan. I want to see this thing launch. Is it happening this gonna year? Be, it's going to be well. It's going to be interesting because um, it sounds like we're hearing multiple things. So mm -hmm. um, I talked with um, I talked with a couple of the flow uh, flow directors for um, exploration ground systems um, on the 16th, which was just a couple of days before the test, and. I think what they're thinking is the, a realistic time frame is 10 months. And I remember, I think like half a year ago, we were talking about how long it was taken. I didn't think it was going to take that long. So I was wrong. They, I think they're thinking realistically with, um, you know, thing, you know, factoring even outside factors like hurricanes possibly and other weather um, that there's a, it's going to take about 10 months from when the core stage gets there until they're ready to launch. Now, having said that, I'm not expecting them to set a work to launch date. Um, I would still not be surprised if they try and, you know, try and get it in the calendar year. Um, and it'll just be a question of there's just a lot of testing. Um, uh, you know, this is going to be the s sort of second part of the of the story, and where we talk about well, why is it going to take ten months? And it's just um, putting physically bolting everything together doesn't take that much time, but then you have to test all of it. Um, right. And it's not just spacecraft to launch vehicle. And in this case, the launch vehicle is, you've got the boosters in the core, and then the upper stage is basically like a commercial off the shelf upper right. stage. It's the Delta IV upper stage with a, with a, with a uh, liquid hydrogen tank stretch. But I mean, that's got, it's a basically a self-contained rocket stage um, built by United Launch Alliance. Which they're so if, uh, SLS kind of considers it to be a payload. So it's so you've mm -hmm. got the boosters in the core um, that are kind of one thing. Then you've got the ICPS, which is another spacecraft upper stage, and then you've got the Orion. So those all have to talk to each other, and then all three of those also have to talk through the mobile launcher to the launch control mm -hmm. center and the firing room and the ground control systems, and those all have requirements and specifications. And you know, you guys. Uh, Chris will remember the the uh, OMRS for the shuttle. Um, it's not going to may may not be quite as um, gigantic for any of these three pieces as as the orbiter and the the shuttle system was. But you know when they when they when they're looking at the data in their in the launch control center, it has to meet all those requirements and specifications. So I think and they're being conservative about you know we may have to tweak things or first time through like if if they've got a like late like if you have a measurement that's like got a range of between 100 and 250 and i'm just making this up they may find out that they need to fix the range rather than the than the actual value it's like they're like well this was what we you know again kind of going back to what happened in the first hot fire on green run um they you know the vehicle behaves one way and they've got it they've got their initial um um, and you know analytical prediction about how it's going to behave, and then you start to then you start to actually kind of uh, correlate those and calibrate your predictions to what the vehicle actually does. So some of that will be there, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah, and and I mean not not just that. I mean like th this is also very critically the first time all of it is being assembled together. It's the first chance they have with the actual flight hardware to see how it all communicates, right? And they need to, you know, like make sure like the vehicle's um, inertial guidance system is operating correctly, right? You know, they need to be able to switch that on and watch the actual engine gimbal to try to correct for Earth's rotation, right? Um, right. But then there are even things like what your article this morning specifies um, and talks about, which is they can actually only do so much of the checkout on the solid rocket boosters because they literally get to a point where they have to wait for the flight computer that's in the core stage being right. mated to the solid rockets to finish that, to finish the closeouts on, on the boosters. And then you've got to make sure not just that the whole rocket can talk to each other, but you want to make sure the core is talking to the boosters properly before you stack the interim cryogenic propulsion stage on top. Right. And, and, and the CubeSats aren't even ready, so they might be using, you know, structural test articles for the for portions of uh, the Orion stack during during the initial testing. So yeah, I, it, it it is interesting, but you you can kind of see how quickly this 
adds up to 10 months, especially since this one is also going to the launch pad for a full up wet dress rehearsal and then coming back to the vehicle assembly building after that as well. You know, all of that does add up very quickly. Yeah. Yep. And it's, I mean, it sounds like, you know, it, when they're ready to roll out for the, for the wet dress rehearsal, that, that, that'll be a, a sort of a milestone in and of itself um that i'd say most of the testing will be in the vehicle assembly building and so most of that 10 months at least on paper is supposed to be in the vehicle assembly building now you know we'll see what happens when they get out there um but uh i think they're expecting they're expecting the wet dress rehearsal because there's it's a uh, standard launch pad flow that they want to uh, Evolve to is only a week long. Um, they have some specific engineering tests that they can't do in the VAB or are not really a great idea to do that involve uh, SRB hydraulic power unit hydrazine. Um, so things like a, hydro, a, a HBU hot fire, they'll do that um, out at the pad. Um, but there's they're also going to be doing an EMI test of the vehicle, which you really have to do outdoors and um so they'll they'll be doing extra tests during the wet dress rehearsal but they're still talking about three weeks four weeks for that and so that's that's not that much time out of the whole schedule it's it's just yeah it's like if the 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 like very high level outline is when the core stage gets there they'll they will stack the entire sls they'll put the orion they're going to put a, an Orion simulator on top of that that simulates the weight and CG of Orion. Um, they'll do SLS checkouts with all of the infrastructure, with the mobile launcher and the VAB, the crawl, you know, crawler transporter, all the way through to the launch control center that's you know adjoins the VAB. There, they'll do what's called integrated verification testing. Well, that's sort of phase one of that. Then. Yeah. They're going to do an umbilical retract test. So obviously, in order to do that, in order to do the continuity to talk to the vehicle from the launch control center, you obviously have to hook the umbilicals up. So they're going to do that testing with the umbilicals. Then they're going to do a umbilical retract test. There's a launch release system that's a ground side system. Well, that has to work real well when the vehicle, <laughs> when the boosters uh, ignite. So they're going to do a, a release and retract test of the umbilicals at that point. Um, then one, with the umbilicals uh, disconnected, they're going to do a, a, a modal test with this, uh, you know, you'll have the weight and CG of an integrated vehicle. They'll do that. They'll do that modal test. Then they'll de-stack the, the Orion simulator and then the, the uh, stage adapter if they haven't got the CubeSats yet. Then they'll bring the Orion in stack that and then they have to do a full end-to-end -end vehicle test and that that test that chris was talking about is uh is another one of those they call them program specific engineering tests or psats and that's what they're going to do there is and what i heard is they're going to wait till they actually have the real orion spacecraft on there is they um they unlock you know they take they unlock the uh the the the, the tvc systems and the gimbals for the boosters and the engines and they let the SLS uh, inertial navigation unit sense the the uh, the Earth's motion, and the idea is that the 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 point of the test is to make sure that if the if the vehicle guidance is telling the, the uh, vehicle to to roll in a particular direction, that the that the nozzles are 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 going in the right direction. So you avoid that that whole thing with the 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 if, if uh, folks recall a, a proton launch from uh, mm -hmm. several years back where <laughs> I think they put the gyroscopes or at least one or more of them in um, upside, upside down. down. Upside yeah. down. So yeah, that's what that test is for. Um, and so they'll be doing tests like that. Um, and uh, so there's there's a lot of there's a lot of testing that they'll do, and then they'll get there will be a big test. Um, again, this this is something that I think folks from the shuttle program remember. They used to do these big, big loop type integrated tests where you bring you loop in mission control, you loop in Marshall support, you loop in the deep. In this case, now with Orion Deep Space Network, um, you probably loop in all of the um, all of the downrange tracking sites like Bermuda, Wallops, um, and so because on launch day they're going to have to do the same thing, and so mm. this will be this will give them an opportunity to make sure that that all the support centers um, are 
are hooked in correctly and that they're seeing, you know, that they're seeing data from the vehicle either through, you know, either through the ground, you know, uh, hardline ground or, um, or, or a telemetry or, or transmission. So um, they've spent a all lot sorts of, of fun stuff. Because they, they, they spent a lot of time upgrading had B yeah. and all of the systems from the last time they were really upgraded, which was the start of the shuttle program um, and ripping out all of that 70s and early 80s technology and getting, you know, 2010s technology in there at the pad. And, you know, they've hauled the mobile launcher out there a few times um, mm -hmm. to make sure that it was connecting and talking to the ML correctly. So it'll be, it, it'll be really neat the next time this rolls out to see a vehicle going back to pad B because it has been, uh, it has been since October of 2009 that um, a rocket has been on B. Right. Yeah. That, that's the uh, the old the the uh, Aries One X. Aries One X. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yes, Thomas. It's right behind you. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan. But I, I know I'm looking forward to SLS flying. We've got a bunch of questions in chat, so let's. I want to try to get through some of these. Um, first of all, asking about the this, those SLS side boosters. Um, not necessarily asking what engines they use. They're not technically an. I don't know. Do you call a solid booster an engine? It has a nozzle, but Owner. the whole thing is kind of the engine, right? Um, Owner. They, yeah. they, they're they are the same solid boosters that power the shuttle program, correct? To an yeah. extent, um, the casings are all uh, casings that were used during the shuttle program, um, except mm -hmm. there are five segments instead of four. Right. Right. So, but it's the same same propellant mixture, um, a slightly different uh, a slightly different um, shape inside the inside the motor. So, mm -hmm. I think shuttle, which is four segments um, up at the top, you to give yourself more uh, surface area, which gives you gives you more thrust. Um, it, the shuttle had an I think an eleven point star, and uh, and these boosters have a twelve point star up at the top. Um, but very similar in terms of burn rates, um, and and um, you know the thrust trace is relatively similar similar too. Um, but uh, yeah, must, a lot of the hardware um, with some structural uh, they they've modified. For instance, up at the top with the nose cones here. So mm -hmm. basically, the cylinder right below the nose cone there, they've had to beef that structure up obviously because it's going to take higher loads um, between the boosters and then also the core stage. Um, uh, and that's where the that's where the that's where the vehicle uh, the the core stage the boosters basically pick up the core stage and the rest of the vehicle and lift right. them lift them up off the ground. Yeah, these photos, by the way, are from a media event just this past week. Ness, Stephen Marr was there for NASA Space Flight. These are yeah, the on real Wednesday. Artemis One boosters uh, sitting on the mobile launcher currently in the vehicle assembly building, uh, waiting for the core stage to arrive and kind of get put in between them. But uh, these are these are not all of them because the, the boosters are broken up into different components and segments. Some of them have literally flown on shuttle missions before and are were refilled with propellant and, and stacked again. Some of them are also brand new, right? There's like a mix. Yeah, it's a mix. But there's, I'd say most of most of the cases are have been have flown on shuttle flights before. Mm -hmm. And then a, a very similar question, uh, asking how many original shuttle engines will they use on be able to fly on SLS before they make new ones? So I believe this is talking about the liquid engines, the RS twenty fives that are on the core stage, because those also have shuttle history. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there are sixteen engines, uh, sixteen RS twenty five. Well, let me. In terms of the SRB casings, uh, SRB hardware, they have enough hardware to fly eight sets. Mm -hmm. um, for for the RS25 engines, they had 16 engines. Um, I think 15 of them had been fully assembled. Um, 14 of them had flown by the time the shuttle program um, wrapped up. Mm -hmm. And then the other two engines uh, have been uh, have had their engine green runs. Um, so they've been fired, acceptance tested. Um, on the ground here uh, at Stennis, and four set four flight sets. And let us not forget, Orion's maneuvering engine is one of Atlantis's orbital maneuvering engines. So, right. one component of the space shuttle will actually make it to lunar distance. Which um, and I literally learned this this week for <laughs> some reason. 
I like I knew they were the same types of engines, but I'm like, oh, we're building new ones for Orion. Obviously, I don't know why, but apparently, no, we're reusing the ones that we, we, we took out of shuttle, which is super cool. Yep. Um, obviously, until we run out of them. But yeah. Yep. Uh, so whenever you see one of the shuttle orbiters and you're looking at the back end of it, right. and you see those engines, right? They are um, they are nozzles that flew previously in the program, usually um, mm -hmm. that were just removed from flight for various reasons as they age. There's no actual engine inside of there. Right. And you're also just looking at mock-ups of orbital maneuvering system engines because we took them all for SLS and Orion at the end of the program. Right. I got one last question and then we'll wrap up the SLS update. This is all in preparation for the first Artemis mission, Artemis 1, which is an uncrewed test flight what are what is the big mission objective for this flight launching maybe this year at the latest maybe next year uh what is this big main objective as it kind of kick starts the artemis program what are we looking for well it's a i mean for sls it's a it's a first flight it's a flight test of sls uh for orion this is the first full i mean aside from uh crew systems this is this will be the first time that it flies as a um, standalone spacecraft. So if you remember the, the flight test that they did at the end of 2014 was a, a, a crew module with a uh, uh, simulated service module. And so the, the, the service module for that flight was really the Delta IV upper stage, mm -hmm. um, which, which took it up to uh, several thousand miles, uh, I think Apogee before it came back. But this time Orion will actually uh, completely separate from the launch vehicle and it will uh, it's it's going to do a four to six week long lunar orbit mission. And the idea is to push, you know, to push it beyond, you know, somewhat beyond uh, the types of durations that that the hardware would see with the crew. They're a little bit more limited in terms of how long they can fly just because of the amount of food and uh, oxygen that they can carry on board. But without a crew, they, the, the, the spacecraft can fly for a long time. And so they're going to stay in orbit around the moon, either uh, either for a week and a half or a couple of weeks. Um, but the idea is, yeah, you you get a chance to you get a chance to do uh, navigation beyond the you know beyond the Earth, and um, you're you're testing out all of the systems in the service module, and then you also the the biggest test is the is a heat shield uh, a heat shield test from lunar velo lunar return velocity. So um this is this is sort of a the first full up orion sls launch and uh so both of those vehicles will be getting their first uh big shakeouts on this uh on this flight all right well thank you so much i want to run through we've got a bunch of super tests that have come through here recently so let's try and run through those and then we've got some starship news to talk about uh Dougal, which is a regular in the uh, Super Chat and our, our chat queue, says, Peter Beck, then Marcus House, are you able to say who we might hear from next as a special guest or who y'all would like as special guests? Uh, I can report that we have some more special guests in the works. Um, some of them may already even be scheduled, but uh, I think we'll wait a little bit to reveal exactly who they are. Uh, we, we've got some more people coming on. And uh, let us know also if you've got ideas, because you might think of someone that we might not have thought of. So if, you, if there's someone you, you want to uh, see on NASA Space Flight Live, let us know, let them know, and uh, we'll, we'll see who else we can get on. But yeah, we've got more special guests coming. Don't worry. Uh, we got a, a super chat question here. How would NASA be keeping in touch with people going to Mars and while at Mars in real time, satellites along the way? So it's hard to do that in real time, right? Because the speed of light is kind of the, the time limit as far as how fast a radio signal can travel. And so we're, we're actually going to have to talk to people on a delay, right? And that's something we're trying to test a little bit going to the moon before going to Mars, maybe? I mean, it's, yeah, because the isn't instantaneous right it would be like right. I mean, the pause is intentional there's no audio issue it like the moon <laughs> is there is there you know equivalent of me asking the question and getting the response right yeah. which is doable right like it's not how we're That's still like real time but yeah exactly whereas like i i'm not going to pause for 24 minutes, which is what the communication <laughs> delay would be, you know, to ask the question and get an instant answer if the person knew the instant answer. But yeah, it's something we can 
pests, but we can also simulate it pretty well on the ground in our mission simulators where you can isolate mm -hmm. a crew and you can train them for longer periods of uh, communication delay. Really quick, I want to go around the horn with this question. Uh, very generous $25 super chat. So thank you, Chris. Uh, asking Dragon, Orion, Starliner, and Soyuz, which would you rather be on for ascent, orbit, and re entry? Really quick, pick one. Uh, Philip, you first. Dragon, Orion, let's see. Uh, it's Starliner. You know, they're all, they're all, ca I mean, can we, how about Starship? You know? Ooh, uh, good answer. Because those are all capsules. You know, I mean, it, it does, those they're actually very similar. The rides are going to be similar. I, re entry, okay. Soyuz, I would take Soyuz for the re entry yeah. if you want. You want the you want the roller coaster ride followed by a car crash. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, that is yeah, it's pretty accurate, Chris. Uh, if I had to choose one of those four only, I would choose um, I'd choose Dragon. I, I think I would too of those four. Um, Starship's not a bad shout out, but if we're adding other vehicles that are not on this list, I'd pick Shuttle personally. Yeah, I would you... pick Shuttle. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. We could do our Dream Chaser. Yes. Or, or a Dream Chaser. That would probably be a little similar, right? There you yeah. go. <laughs> Thank you for the uh, super chat there, Chris. Um, let's see here. Uh, a super chat here saying happy birthday, NSF. The website and YouTube channel are a big part of many of my days. Like next Monday, hopefully, talking about Starship. Uh, We're going to get to that yeah. in a second. Stay tuned. Uh, but, but uh, yeah, Yazata, thank you so much for the super chat and for the kind words. Uh, Jim saying, love your work. Thank you so much. Kaz Masters with a super chat as well. Thank you very much. And then, uh, all right, we got a, we got a Starship question. I'll get back to that in a second. Um, and then another one from Jacob saying, happy birthday, NSF. I love L2. So there you go. Happy birthday, NSF, and check out NSF, NSF's L2. All right. Uh, let's give a status update on our favorite shiny rocket down in Boca Chica, Texas. Starship <laughs> SN11, uh, having, of course, had a static fire yesterday, which is what this video yes. clip is, uh, which was successful. A single engine static fire looks like they may have had to do some minor uh, repairs or, or tweaks uh, prior to the previous static fire. So this is the second one, uh, but just testing that one single engine uh, and that actually put them in a stance that they were ready for flight. But then there was no flight. Uh, we, we, there, there was, the weather wasn't great all day, as you can see. And I mean, in this video, it just looks like a little foggy and cloudy. It only got worse going, uh, going on. Eventually, we just stopped seeing Starship. Uh, so, poor Jack, so, like poor Jack, like yeah. saw it at eight thirty in the morning and never again for the rest yeah. of the day. <laughs> Jack would chime in on our broadcast stream and go, I've got breaking news. I still can't see Starship. So yes. uh, <laughs> unfortunately, the weather was not cooperative, but it kind of worked out because it ended up not flying. Hopefully the weather will cooperate on Monday. Um, yeah. However, I don't think we believe that was actually the problem. Uh, Elon actually made a tweet that said they were standing down from SN11 until probably Monday to make some additional checkouts. So it sounds like there might have been some minor technical things that they want to make sure is completely resolved uh, prior to flight. So it might not have actually been a weather issue. Uh, but they're yeah, getting now, close. It, yeah, now it now that doesn't dis discount the fact that maybe weather might have been an issue, right, but in true. the end, it was a technical thing that got them. Because one thing that I think is is important to point out is, yes, yeah, spaceship is being designed to launch in adverse conditions. This, this was just low cloud cover and fog. There was no lightning risk mm -hmm. or anything like that. Could they have launched and landed successfully? Yeah, they could because Starship uses radar, right? In, right. in part of its landing system, it's not it's not trying to put on its glasses, going, "I can't see through <laughs> the fog." We, um, but um, it's what if it lands successfully or doesn't land successfully, and you need to respond to that. But the weather is not conducive to responding to whatever True. state the vehicle is in at the end. Um, you know, I, I think that could have been a consideration just. In the end, it ended up being a technical thing that got him. Sure. And we've got a whole bunch of questions. So I think, I mean, <laughs> I figured, to think. Any, yeah. any other brief status updates we should give before we just dive into full blown Q&A? Because we always know there's no shortage of Starship questions. I mean, the flight is no earlier than Monday. Um, yep. but we don't, I don't think we have a firm testing window for that. Uh, I know flight restrictions have gone up. I don't know if we have road closures yet. So basically everything but the Cameron, but, but the restriction for maritime and road. Yes. Basically, like everything that Cameron County handles is not out yet, but everything the federal government handles in terms of the FAA and airspace closures and everything are totally out er, right. and, and complete. So we're waiting for marine hazard zones, road closures from the county and an official confirmation from SpaceX. 
Right. And Elon basically. has confirmed that they're targeting Monday, basically, with that tweet. Um, SpaceX will yes, likely further yes. confirm that on the day of. But do we do kind of already have an official confirmation to that end? E um, e exactly. I, I, at least I at that, it's a no earlier then. Oh, oh well, there, well, there we go. The SpaceX website is confirmed. So we're does it get much just... more official than that then? There we go. So uh, basically, over the weekend, we should get the other restrictions from Cameron County. Yeah. And of course, also pending whatever additional checkouts they're doing, but they should have the weekend should be enough time for right. them to do that, we would imagine. Um, yeah, I think those are the big things. So I, th I say let's dive into questions. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, sure. Um, that is, of course, the hot topic. So let's see. Uh, we will do a, a super chat question here from Vinny. Thank you so much. It looks to me that the mystery structure is going to be support for the GSE tank they are building. It probably needs that type of support. All right. So first question is something not about SN11, but we'll talk about this really quick. <laughs> Yes, it's the mystery structure. Yes. Yes. Uh, so there is this this weird. Oh, I gotta find it. Hold on. Here we go. Uh, a no, that's a GSE dome. I will right, we'll pull this video up. We've got so much footage from Boca Chica Gal. It's kind of hard to you know find the right one at every time. But uh, I believe it shows up in this video. Are there timestamps here? Let's see. There. Yes. There Don't mind me while I scroll video. through. In the video. Uh, they're also here. I'm trying to see I've if there's there. a if the mystery shark. Do I, am I staring at it? Uh, it's too blurry on my preview screen to help you. <laughs> uh, I don't know if it says it, but we'll, we'll talk about this. There, there is a mystery structure that has kind of appeared in Boca Chica that we're not sure exactly what it is. There's a lot. There's a lot of ground support equipment, which is what when we say GSE. By the way, I feel like that's an acronym we use a lot, and we keep forgetting to explain to new people what that actually means. It stands for ground support equipment. Basically, all the equipment around the launch site and the landing sites and uh, that that are used to support the launch operations, but aren't actually on the vehicle. Big commodity tanks and things like that. Um, so so yeah, but basically yeah. you need to store your you need to store your nitrogen. You need to store your liquid oxygen. You need to store your liquid methane that you're going to pump into the vehicle. You need tanks to do that. And basically, instead of reinventing the wheel and making tanks from structures other than Starship, SpaceX just said, "Let's just make the tanks from the Starship stuff instead." Yeah. You know. <laughs> And, and simplify it. I mean, it's I, I laugh because it's such a simple solution for how to make a tank. Uh, right. It's yeah. So yeah, this this and this B roll will show some of that. But basically, yeah, uh, they're they're building a bunch of ground tanks for that orbital launch, set, which of course is going to be pretty pretty uh, important, especially if they're going to make that orbital launch this summer or whatever their internal target may become. Uh, but uh, they're trying to do it soon, so we're going to keep an eye on that. And yeah, that mystery structure may be related. Um, we call it a mystery structure because we don't know for sure, uh, but we'll keep we'll keep you updated to, to that extent. And and I think uh, and I think to that end too, you know, it's it's worth mentioning since we're briefly on the subject of propellant and GSC um, yeah. tanks that their um, propellant production facility is also coming along and making mm -hmm. uh, good strides. I know we get a lot of questions about this during the live stream about like, why well, you know how are they making all that propellant? Where are they getting it from? They're gonna make it. Um, they're gonna make it. So um, you know, you'll have just transferring it. You know the production site and the fuel farms and the tanks at the orbital pad instead of you know having huge truckloads of it being brought in from outside. So, yeah. And on and on the screen right now, that is one of those GSE, those ground support equipment tanks. Um, you can if it, if you're saying it looks like a Starship tank, it's because it's just a Starship tank that they up and with that label on it though. Um, and so, um, actually, um, on, if if you look in our link stock, um, Michael has just thrown in yeah, the link to the structure, yeah, for us here. That the question Michael is about, linked me an L two photo, so I have to log in really quick and then refresh the link. But yes, <laughs> uh, but but yeah, this this is honestly part of the fun of of watching what goes on down there, right? Because things will start to appear, and you're like, well, what's that for? You know, <laughs> uh, and there's sometimes almost on a, on a weekly basis. It, it, it can seem, but um, but yeah. Um, I'll, I'll bring up some more questions. I'm gonna get that photo up. Yeah. But don't worry. But uh, uh, a question here from Leonardo asking: Are there are there any big differences between SN10 and SN11 equipment or system wise? Do we know what kind of changes they've implemented? Yeah. Um. So there hasn't been a lot of word on specifically if there was any or if there were any hardware changes or anything like that. We know that SN10's uh, hard landing and subsequent boom was caused by um, a helium injection in or helium ingestion into the Raptor engine, and that was caused from the helium pressurization that they switched to after the autogenous 
pressurization system for the um header tank for the methane header tank uh failed during the SN8 uh landing. So they switched to helium to pressurize it and then that led to um some helium ingestion. Um so I know Musk has said that the the biggest um um change would likely be looking at switching to not just igniting three engines flip and burn and then shutting two of them down and doing the landing on one like SN10 tried to do but keeping two of them up and trying your best to land on two for as long as possible before you run into hitting the throttle limits of the raptors because you can only throttle the raptor engine down so much before you would basically it wouldn't be able to sustain the combustion in a proper way and it would just flame out um on you and you don't want to do that so they they've talked about that but then spacex's overview of the flight that they put on their website stopped just short of saying how many engines they were actually going to do the landing on it was very detailed on the engines uh, on every other portion of the flight um which may indicate that uh, which may indicate two things one that it's unchanged um and that they literally just can't make that change to two landing on two raptors just yet um but that might be something we'll see in the next cohort of starships it could also be an indication that they're just don't know or that they were copying and pasting over text and they just decided not to include that part in it you know it's kind of impossible to tell um until flight day and hoping they will say it um either on flight day or um we will wait and see how many shut down <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Uh, really quick, I've got this image to show. This is what we're calling yes. the the mystery structure. Um, it's it's because we don't know what it is. Uh, it does look like just like a very basic support of some kind. It could be for ground support equipment, like you like that one question uh, mentioned. Uh, but we're gonna stay tuned and see what exactly they use it for. Uh, but this is what we're talking about when we refer to the mystery structure. I know it's a vague name, so here's the photo of of what exactly we're talking yes. about. Um, since it has kind of appeared at the same time of other ground support equipment, I would guess that's a that's a reasonable uh, hypothesis. But yeah. we will have to wait and see. But who know? It could be like part of the bar. I you know. <laughs> sure. Um, we got a question here from Gene Mark. Thank you for the super chat question asking compared to a full starship launch, what is the noise of SLS? So comparing two of the, uh, really heavy lift vehicles under development noise levels, comparisons between the two. Have, I, I have to be very honest here. I do not know what the decibel levels, um, are predicted to be for both of these vehicles. Um, all I can tell you, um, it's not a direct correlation, but, um, you know the solid rockets are louder than liquid fueled engines usually you know but really the only way i can answer that is just in the sheer amount of thrust that the vehicles are designed for at liftoff um sls is designed for 8.3 million pounds at liftoff ramping up to 8.8 .8, um very early into the ascent um and the starship super heavy with all 20 eight Raptor engines firing is close to 16 million pounds of thrust. So nearly double SLS's thrust at liftoff. Again, it's not a direct correlation. That doesn't mean SL, uh, that doesn't mean um, Starship will be twice as loud. It doesn't work that way um, right. in terms of um, sound. Um, and again, the solid rockets will be louder than Raptors. So right. it, it, I, I don't know. I'll let you know when I see them. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, the like, real answer is to launch yeah. both of them and find out. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Philip, do that. We're talking about SLS, and th those boosters are such a loud component. Um, that's an that's a legit engineering concern that they have to work with, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, there's the 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 sounds. There's a there's a decent sound suppression system. Um, I mean, they they even have they even used them for the you know for this for the last screen run as well. And I think in terms of if we're talking about uh viewers experience um mm -hmm. obviously the, the the other big component to it is how far away from the rocket you are and so again i, I you know 16 million pounds of thrust i i'd be curious you know we're about i want to say four miles from 39b at the press site um about that. yeah 
Uh, but then that's, I mean, really that one's relatively well known. I, I, you guys might know better. Well, you would know better than I would how far away you're going to be from the super heavy pads. I, uh, I wish we there. knew. I don't think we know yet. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, we can venture, we can venture somewhat of a guess by right. just going with South Padre Island. Um, yeah. cause that's as close as the public's going to be able to get, um, Dude, hang on. I'll get that for you in a second. Chris is going to get on that. But that's, I mean, that's, you know, that's, um, you know, the, the, the thing about the sound in terms of the engineering part of it is, you know, for both vehicles, I imagine they have a decent thrust to, uh, you know, uh, thrust to weight, uh, liftoff ratio and climb out ratio. So really one of the biggest um, advantages you have is you're getting away from the sound relatively quickly. So you're, you're putting a lot of distance between the acoustic rebound off of structures um, that's, I mean, that was the problem that they that they were trying to deal with with the water flow in at Stennis is, you, you're the rockets held in place and you've got this really loud acoustic wave, and it just rebounds right off the flame bucket if you don't do anything about it, and then you're getting those acoustic waves interplaying with you for for eight minutes because you're in place. Whereas right. during a launch, you know, 16 million pounds of thrust for the super heavy, it's it's climbing away from that relatively quickly and it's sort of climbing away from the, from the sound waves. Uh, uh, so it, that <laughs> helps. Eventually traveling faster than them. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, South Padre Island, um, which is the closest current public viewing location is five miles um, from the southernmost tip, the closest. That, you that get. would be, that would be um, interesting for that big of a vehicle. It, it, it would be, but <laughs> what, what's interesting too, that that's not necessarily the minimum safe distance because you know spacex controls launches right now from two-ish miles away at the stargate center um they're talking about like incorporating and making this city in starbase for you know up close viewing and and the larger point i'm trying to make here is that um you know you when you're calculating the what's the minimum safe distance people can watch a liftoff arm you're, you're calculating that based on if it explodes right where will it rain debris down onto because the actual size range that you'd be concerned with for for sound is going to be inside of the of the danger zone for where it could throw debris in, in that case so you could actually even be closer than that five miles <laughs> yeah. to the uh, uh to it at liftoff and, and be absolutely fine yeah. All, uh, here's my per perfectly scientific method of answering this question. We're going to launch SLS from 39B, and then Starships of, and Super Heavy is eventually going to launch from 39A, and we'll just watch both from the press site, and we'll see which one was louder. Because they're roughly, I know 39A is a little <laughs> closer, I know, wow. but you know, it, it's close. Anyway, let's well, see some I, more. Be, I'm oh. going to be real curious. Go. I'm going to be real curious about what they do with, with the Super Heavy out of 39A. Because um, I'm, you know, uh, over in the past with even with shuttle launches there's been some sort of consternation from authorities about how many people you can have that close to mm -hmm. the vehicle and so you will have a larger blast danger area i assume with the with the super heavy and you know they've you know they've kind of gone uh, um up and down over the decades with with shuttle obviously it's been a while but I would imagine there will be some discussions about how many people you can have in within that close to 39A for that vehicle. Um, in Texas, it might be a little different. You know, it's obviously also That's a true. different it's a different range as well. So well, but to but 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 to be fair, when um uh when Southcom 1B launched um and went south out of there. Thomas and I were literally 20 feet away from where the road closed for the blast danger zone. So mm -hmm. <laughs> we had to, we well, had to drive yeah, I mean, through have... the blast danger area to get to the press site. It was actually kind yeah, of cool. like... you have like there's the you know there's a there's a, a blast danger area, and then once the vehicle starts to move appreciably, then you've got an impact footprint, right? And so right. you know, which is expanding a little bit. It depends, but. Yeah, there's, yeah, it's, I, I, I guess I would just say I would expect, even if the FAA doesn't want to have to deal with it, they will probably be forced to deal with that, with sure. something like that at some point if they fly out of Florida. <laughs> yeah. So. 
A uh, question here about some future starships coming up. First of all, will they plan to reuse SN11 if it lands safely? My guess is that the answer will be no. Uh, keep in mind, they've got other starships that are coming that incorporate new upgrades to the system and to the design. And uh, it wouldn't make much sense to reuse SN11 when you're trying to get data on the new designs anyway. So my, my guess is that you are um, not going to have that happen. Any differing opinions? No, no differing opinion there. Um, uh, yeah, you know, you got 15, 16, 17 um, there, and you want to get 20 and booster number three ready by early July to actually fly uh, and, and, and attempt an orbital flight. You know, you also have to get through um, the ground test campaign for... Um, booster number one, then you got to get booster number two out to one of the suborbital pads. You've got to install raptors in it. You've got to fuel it. You've got to fly it, right? BN2 is going to be the first one to fly of boosters. And every time you need to launch something um, like that, every time you need to fuel something, you need to close down the launch area. Mm -hmm. And that's going to impact the ability to continue building out the orbital platform um, and the orbital launch stand that are needed for early july at this point for that target so it all becomes a balancing act of do you really need to fly it again and if and if there is a valid reason to fly it again they will um but if there isn't if it's just like eh, it'd be nice but do we re then the question becomes but do we really have the time you know i think and gotcha um so on that end if they're not reusing sn11 obviously they're going for some upgrades on future starships here is a wild speculation question which starship will be the one to go into orbit? <laughs> uh, I mean, how... the, the one to make it to orbit or try to get to orbit? Um, the question 20... is, which starship will be able to go into orbit? Well, be able to go into orbit uh, 20. Yeah, because right. it'll be the first. Um... But if that's the one that actually goes, you know, I don't know. You, not only to get to orbit, not only does the starship need to be good to go, but it needs to have a super heavy that's ready to go with it, right? So yeah, and so so right now that'll be BN three, but right. um, but in just terms of sheer capability, which one will be capable or able to go to orbit first? It's SN twenty. And so we'll see how quickly they get there. And of course, plans always change in Boca Chica, but uh, that's what we're looking at right now. And we'll see what kind of time frame that ends up actually occurring in. Could be later this year. Um, pivoting to the super heavies really quick. Do we are we expecting booster BN one? To have a static fire, I believe the answer is maybe. <laughs> yeah. So the, the the answer is, oh, it's one of my favorite lines from Futurama. A firm maybe. Yeah. Um. Uh. It it has been outfitted with the necessary equipment to mount a raptor to it. Or I it's BN one. I go. planned it that <laughs> way. I didn't. Anyway. <laughs> um. But we don't exactly know how much of how far into the process they plan to go with this being a ground pathfinder. Right. Um, they, we know that Elon has confirmed um, after our reporting that, yep, no, it's, it's, it's a ground pathfinder. It's not meant to fly. Um, if everything goes well, might they want to put a couple of raptors in it and fire it up and see? Maybe, maybe. Um, it would definitely give them more data and maybe help streamline the process a little bit better as booster number two comes along. Um, we'll, we're just going to have to wait and see how that all pans out. Um, or maybe. Yeah. Philip, is there a, kind of a similar scenario with SLS? I mean, we've got Core Stage 1, which was the first one to do its hot fire test, is actually flight hardware. But were there Pathfinders that came before that as far as developing a new giant booster stage? Nothing that's like a propulsion test article, like they're talking about. Like my understanding of a uh, BN one is, is that you know you it would, you would at least be capable of of loading it with propellants and and checking out mm -hmm. the checking out the the launch pad systems and propellant delivery systems. But for for SLS, Core Stage One was the first one that you could put propellant in. All you had before that were uh, structural test articles, which really don't have any plumbing in them, or you have like a you know ground pathfinder, which is basically just a glorified uh, steel cylinder and really nothing else to it. So it was a you know mimic the weight and CG of the core stage, but really just for lifting 
uh, at lifting and handling purposes, but you know, not not really getting into rocket, you know, rocket testing or, or, or launch mm -hmm. pad testing. Gotcha. Uh, about BN1's time frame, any idea when BN1 is going to roll out of the high bay? My personal uh. guess, as soon as SN11 is done flying, whether, whatever yes. condition <laughs> SN11 is in when it's done flying, as soon as, soon as they can, because I bet that I think that's the next one, right? Uh, yes, BN1 will be the next one out to uh, the suborbital launch pads. Yep, we're going to take a break from uh, Starship, um, and they're going to move over to BN1 and do some testing with it uh, before SN15 uh, is ready to go out to the pad for its uh, sequence of tests. And uh, and yeah, so um, the uh, the crews were definitely sta uh, stacking stacking <laughs> weights. Gosh, okay, stacking weights um, onto the. Um, on, onto the transporter that's used to move the starships and will be used to move super heavy um as well um this could be for a couple of things <laughs> um it could be preparation for bn1 hauling bn1 out to the pad it could also be in preparation of okay sn9 landed now we have to get it off the landing pad um and maybe they want to bring and you know you don't know where they want to bring it, right? This goes right. into what they want to do with it. Would they pick it up and would they want to put it back on the on the other launch stand? Would they want to maybe you know hook it up to equipment out there and put it through pressure test after it came back? You know what kind of testing do they? There's testing they can do with it that isn't flying it again, right? Right, um, and that would be less of an impact to operations at the orbital pad right so it could be for that uh to move it off the out of the area and bring it back to the um production site more than likely it's to haul bn1 out to the pad because to me if i were looking at this what's the most efficient way if you want to go out and bring that out there to get sn9 back if it lands successfully well haul bn1 out and then since you have to go there just haul bn1 out with you and then swap and then you know. Swap and pick up SN11 and bring SN11 back. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we had a question here. We know they were working after the static oh. fire yesterday. They were working on arming the flight termination system. We saw the lifts up on the side of the vehicle. We actually have a question about that. What is the wind limit for those pad lifts to go up? I think we actually know the answer. Does anyone? I think would Michael that be on one of our spreadsheets? Uh, maybe, Michael, do you know off the top of your head what the wind limit for those is? I know we've talked about it before. I'm yeah, his, I'm gonna take his. Wait, well, we don't. Okay, yeah. we, we will try to get that answer for you. I think somewhere we we do know actually the limit of what the what workers can go up on those big lifts are to uh, access the flight termination system and things like that. We'll we'll come back to you. But thank you for the question. Uh, okay, cool. Twenty eight miles per hour. So there you go. Um, so that's one thing that we do look for when we're talking about weather conditions. It's not just whatever the weather constraints are for the flight itself but for the workers to complete the pre-flight work that needs to get done. So um, if you hear us talk about that, that's what we're referring to. Thank you for the question. Um, a question here about uh, the super heavy booster. Will SpaceX perform a 10 kilometer flight or something similar with the booster? What kind of flight tests could we see happening with super heavy? Very good question. Um, I, I, I mean, here, here's where, here's where my mind struggles with. It's a very good question, and I really don't know the answer. So, I mean, if if you wanted to, um, if you wanted to fly the booster to do a landing, like an like a reentry test of some kind, mm -hmm. right? You would need to put some kind of an aerodynamic cap, yeah, on top of it. Um, otherwise, it would the, the the stresses would tear itself. They would tear it apart. Right. Um, the way my brain misfires in trying to answer that question is a test like that would make sense. However, you can also just put a starship on top exactly. of it, exactly. launch it, and if you do get successfully to the end of your two minute, 50 second burn <laughs> of a full uh, first stage super heavy burn duration there and separate starship, well, now just turn around and come back. Like right, you know, exactly. and now just literally do your test. In it. So I, it's a great question. What will the flight profile of BN2 be? Have absolutely no clue because I don't know what you would logically want to test, except for maybe just the structure is so big. Maybe they will actually, maybe they'll get good data out of like a 150 meter pop 
right? Where you're controlling right. it on a few engines, but you're getting good actual in the air validation for what the computer models say should be the handling characteristics of a 70 meter tall grain silo that you're trying to land on the ground. Yeah. And maybe that's what it ends up going with. Other than that, it's a great question. I, I couldn't fathom another guess <laughs> after that. I think I agree. I, I, I think maybe BN2, 150 meter hop, that sounds reasonable. And then if BN3 is that first orbital attempt, that might be the first time a super heavy tries to land from an actual and like an orbital launch profile. Yeah. Um, that I could totally see that happening. I mean, it's very common for when, especially when that testing doesn't affect mission success, right? right? That's how they learned how to do Falcon 9 landings too. They simply did orbital launches, saving the fuel needed in that first stage for the landing attempt, and then tried to land. Because whether it works or not, the second stage is still performing as expected and will deploy whatever payload to whatever orbit. Um, I would imagine Super Heavy takes a similar approach. That's why they're testing Starship so much more earlier. Also because Starship is a more complicated part of the two-part system, right? It's got a lot more systems on board, and its landing profile is so much different. Um, right. But yeah. Uh, I think, I don't know, it's kind of like a, I mean, how are they testing the first SLS booster? They're launching an orbital mission, right? Um, <laughs> and, and so so it, it, that's, you know, you can do it in an all-up test flight. You don't have to do everything in very incremental uh, ports uh, parts. Um, I, that's personally what I'm expecting, but we'll have to wait and see. Yeah. Uh, we got time for a few more questions here, so I'll just keep them coming. Um, do you think that SpaceX will try to condense liquid nitrogen at the former well site? So we've talked about them producing methane and oxygen. Could they, we know that they use nitrogen for purging ground lines and things like that? Could they do that from Earth's head? I mean, lots of nitrogen in the air surrounding the, the tank farm. I don't know. Is that even oh, been discussed? Uh, oh, like pull out of the air. Right, or, or or maybe or maybe they're talking about it. Just says condensed. They could be talking about recondensing like nitrogen that has gone through purging trying to recapture that although the point of purging is to get other stuff out of the line so i don't know if you'd want that <sighs> nitrogen back i don't know yeah um uh, you, I anyone mean, no, you, do, you, do they do, they do that at all search, like well, i mean you can scrub nitrogen out of the air i mean yeah so i know scrub carbon dioxide and oxygen out of the air um so they uh, could certainly can they could certainly pull it out of the air if they wanted to i don't know what benefit you would get in terms of trying to cycle it if that's what you mean um yeah. and on the off chance you mean like condense like compact like densify it like they do with the liquid oxygen mm. on the falcon i don't think condensing liquid nitrogen would be anything right that doesn't give you any yeah. benefits but i yeah. mean on cape canaveral side kennedy space center side sls systems or other launch systems they do they all, all any they don't recapture the nitrogen that they use to purge those lines right philip do you know uh uh, I don't. That's a good question. I don't think so. I mean, I think you know, for instance, so they're using. I think just they use liquid nitrogen. You know, they 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 uh, transfer it in liquid form just because it's, you know, the volumes are smaller. But then mm -hmm. you know, in terms of actually using it, um, they're they're vapor. You know, they vaporize right. it. They turn it. It's actually heated, a heated gas purge, and then. Uh, you know, like the, the the core stages actually just got vents to to equalize. So yeah, those you've probably got you know pure nitrogen gas coming out of those vents, and so I think yeah, just vents to air because it's you know it's the idea is you're you've got a really cold uh, engine compartment, and so you're using it for flammability purposes, but also as a temperature control. Um, so uh, you know, I don't know. You could, I, I, it's, I, it's, I guess it's possible you could, you could <laughs> capture that. Um, but yeah, I would think if you're just using it as sort of a essentially air conditioning and, hum, you know, humidity and temperature control, it's, you're, you're, it's just kind of all over the place. Uh, and then might be harder to capture that um, to, you know, to, to recycle it. And uh, one last question, I think, before we wrap up here, uh, John asked, will SN15 go farther than 10 kilometers? So the next Starship high altitude flight test, we looking at 10 kilometers again, testing out whatever upgrades are on that vehicle that way, or maybe pushing it a little farther? The fantastic question, to which you'd have to ask Elon Musk. Um, yeah. we, we do not know. Uh, the, the honest answer is we don't know. Um, we've obviously seen the range that they're capable of flying in 
range between 10 and 20. We know they lowered to 10 just because you stay out of some of the lower portions of the atmosphere you where you'd be really concerned with shear in that regard to make it easier to test and meet some uh, weather requirements. But it's possible they'd want to go higher with a uh, 15. It's possible they'd want to stress 15 a bit more um, than the previous versions. But how they're going to do that or what they're going to do, what, we just need to stay tuned. Um, and I'm sure they'll start. I'm sure Elon might start talking about it after um, after SN11 flies. Gotcha. Well, really quick, we've got some super chats to go through too here really quick. Uh, Ryan says, here's for the birthday cake fund. Appreciate it. Happy birthday to the NSF website. And uh, a couple of new memberships here also from Jacob and Alistair. Thank you so much. Um, uh, really quick, uh, all right, we'll bring a couple more super chat questions really quick. When they fly Starship to the moon, will they have to refuel? Also, do you think they will use Starship for flying cargo around the world? <laughs> thrust is three uh so yes lunar profile for starship does require on orbit refueling um so that's going to be something we're going to hope to demonstrate on maybe maybe some of the early uh, orbital flights i don't know if it's the first one but pretty quickly uh so they can be ready to support the artemis program and the dear moon program and things like that however there's a caveat here um you need to refuel if you plan to enter orbit of the moon um starship is capable fully fueled on the launch pad of doing a free return trajectory around the moon without an orbital refueling which is what the dear moon mission ah. would do yes because they had um they had in that graphic when they announced more about the dear moon mission that the translator injection is 36 38 minutes after liftoff um from from boca chica so Interesting. All right, so then I take it back. So I know I know Artemis does need require because it needs to enter orbit, but uh, there you go. So Dear Moon would not. Um, we got a super chat here from Paulus saying, I've come to the conclusion that Starship is the Viking longship of the third millennium, and that can land at the uh, at the branch. Other ships can't. Uh, thank you so much for the super chat there. And then uh, Stan says, liquid nitrogen can be extracted with the same equipment as the LOX extraction. Interesting. So I, yep. again, very similar processes. So absolutely. Uh, we were talking about that earlier. I think that is going to wrap up the super chat queue really quick. I want to give a huge thank you to everyone who sends their support that way um, for helping us, allow us to do what we do. I also want to give a big thank you to all of the members of the NASA Space Flight YouTube channel, uh, especially our top members of Launch Director and Flight Engineer. Thank you guys so much for everything all of you do to support the channel. And uh, we could not do any of this without your support. A big thank you to everyone who just tunes into these shows as well, because we appreciate you and your questions. We know we didn't get to all of them, but we tried to get as many as we could. And uh, if you have more, feel free to follow us on social media and send us questions that way. The main account is, of course, at NASA Space Flight. You can also follow us individually. Myself and Chris G are over on Twitter, TGMetsFan98 and Chris G underscore NSF. So you can find us there as well. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Philip, thank you so much for joining us with the SLS update and other insights. Yeah, it was fun. Absolutely. And Chris Gebhardt, always a regular. Uh, see, I keep pointing the wrong way. I keep messing that up. Chris G, managing editor, of, assistant managing editor of NASA Space Flight. Uh, thank you for joining me as well. Of course, my pleasure. And of course, Michael Baylor producing things and operating the stream in the background. A big thank you to his support to the stream. And just a big thank you as well to everyone else who is watching. My name is Thomas Burkert, and we will see you guys on the next episode of NSF Live. But probably before that, we'll probably see you on Monday for Starship SN11 flight attempt, if that holds. So stay tuned for more live coverage from Boca Chica. Until next time, we'll see you next time. Need any more of these.